are listening to the best goddamn podcast available with your host, Rob Childs. All right, and we are back, guys. Today, I have Celeste Hansen. I uh, have stepped away a little bit from doing podcasts uh, just to focus on some some other things that I've had going on. And today, I wanted to get Celeste in here because not only is she a one championship fighter, she's also have an amazing history and a uh, an advocate for women's fighting. Um, so to get her on, have to get a chance to speak with you and go through your crazy story. I've had some amazing women on. I've had uh, Amber Kitchen, Iman Barlow, Roxanne Mataferi, and uh, all of them have had amazing stories. So I thought we could also dive into your story as well. And uh, yeah, so let's just dive into it. It's uh, It's amazing to have you on. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, how's everything going for you? Yeah, thanks for asking me. It's really nice. Yeah, everything's going really good with you. I'm really happy. <laughs> nice, nice. So, uh, yeah, let's just dive right into it. Um, so you you live in Thailand right now, and you, you're you not from Thailand. You're actually from Australia. So let's just kind of back up a little bit and uh, see what it was like growing up in Australia as a child. Was fighting in your family or... You know, did you just have a normal childhood and fall into this or kind of let's let's just kind of start there and walk us through that. Uh, yeah, so my family, they travel and uh, well, in America, we call the carnival, but in Australia, it's called the shows. So we live in a caravan and we travel around Australia. We don't have a house. Um, we sell strawberries and chocolate at the show. And yeah, no, none of my family were fighting, I think. I don't know them, but maybe before someone did boxing, but no one in the time now. Okay. Yeah, so in uh, in doing some research on you, you were talking about how you had kind of been raised like into the uh, in the in the carnival world like you just said. How exactly do you do that? <laughs> like <laughs> Like, I understand, you know, like you were born into it, but what is that like, you know, being around that type of world instead of the traditional, you know, like uh, childhood, I guess? Um, yeah, I absolutely loved it. Uh, growing up in that, I learned how to run a business. Um, I learned how to do everything. So as a child, I could run a whole business and like helping my mom and dad, having they had their own staff and the staff didn't like children telling them what to do, but you know, I knew what to do. So I was very lucky in that aspect. And uh, I had other friends and family that did the same thing. So we all traveled together. So it's just like a traditional thing, but we just all stay together and travel Australia. Yeah. That's, I don't know. They're just, it's to me, it seems like a very strange upbringing. I know for you, it's very normal. Um, I had like a, a very traumatic childhood growing up. So it's always fun for me to hear what other people went through as a child and then to see, you know, as an adult, what you turned into. Um, and you've turned into a monster. <laughs> you, you have turned into, to, uh, you're not just a traditional fighter. I, uh, I actually found out that um, you were the first woman to fight in Lumpini Stadium which is massive. I was actually talking to my coach about that. Um, so I train under uh, Métis Jepadik, and he's a Lumpini champion, and he knew of you, you know, and uh, he thought that that was amazing. It was very non-traditional. Um, but on top of that, you've been an advocate for getting women to fight more or to be more accepted in fighting, which, especially in Muay Thai, is not traditional um so i'm just kind of curious where you got this strength to kind of step out of the box and instead of hoping somebody else takes over this what in your upbringing and childhood and you know in raising kind of gave you this ambition to not only want to be the fighter but to also be the person to help others get the fights and, and push the sport forward 
guess I never really thought about that aspect, but the thoughts that are coming to my head is uh, my mom was a very strong, independent woman. Like she's with my dad, but she didn't take no shit from anyone. Um, She's had physical fights with men because she didn't let them stand over her. Um, I guess in our business, the show carnival, it's also very male dominated and, I guess seeing my mum being so strong brought that onto me and she taught me how to be a strong woman and not let men stand over me yeah. in a power-dominating way. And that has happened a lot in Muay Thai, 100%. Um, and I guess that's where it stems from. And it gave me the strength to stand up for women and give us the power and equality that we deserve. Yeah, there's there's one question I, I need to ask you right now before I forget, and then I want to back up a little bit. Um, when I started training Muay Thai, um, we we don't go through like a lot of like the pre-fight sequences and stuff for like people that unless you have like really big fights. Um, but we did talk about entering the ring and how men are supposed to go over the top rope, but women aren't allowed to. Um, is that still a thing? Is that something that you've had to to go through? And, you know, even just the entrance into the ring being different than males? Yeah, it was, that was the rules until I fought on Fairtex fight. I had my first fight there last, about a year ago, just over a year ago. Okay. And they're very, try, they're modernizing it and everything. And that was at Lumpini Stadium. But previously, yeah, we were only allowed to go under the ring. And before I was like, oh, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. They say because it's women are shorter, they can't go over the top ropes and it's just easier. But now at Lumpini One Championship, um, they let us, yeah, fair text fight, they let us go through the middle of the ropes, which is just normal to me now. But, yes, yeah, absolutely amazing. Yeah, no, that that's that's really cool. So... How do you get into fighting in general, especially Muay Thai, coming from, you know, Australia doing um, the carnivals and things of that nature? Where does fighting come into play in all of this? Yeah, well, actually, (laughs) someone actually called me fat and I went to the gym to lose some weight and they offered boxing. And I was like, oh, my God, I always wanted to be a famous boxer. Uh, a family friend of ours was a famous boxing trainer in Australia and I'd always dreamt of like training with him and becoming a famous boxer but it was all dreams because I traveled and this man he lived in Australia in Sydney sure so I didn't get to see him um and then yeah I went to the gym to lose weight and they offered boxing I said I want to do it they said oh now we've only got Muay Thai but I'd actually been in Thailand previously and watched a Muay Thai fight and there's a girl fighting and Oh my God, just seeing her fight just like lit something up in me. But I never did anything about it. Then years later, when I went to the gym to lose weight and I started Muay Thai, from the first class, I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to fight. And the trainer's like, all right, well, you have to train for at least six months. They'll learn how to protect yourself. I said, well, I don't have time. Like, uh, my family travel, we're going to be moving soon. He said, no, you're not allowed to fight. So I was like, all right, do you know anywhere in Thailand I can train? He said, yeah, and then I, yeah, I moved to Thailand. Wow. <laughs> so I've heard a <laughs> lot of uh, of crazy stories on how people started. I've never heard somebody being called fat and that transition <laughs> into becoming, <laughs> into yes, I'm so becoming historical. That. What's that? Yeah. I'm so happy he called me fat. Otherwise, none of this would have happened, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. In in over here in America right now, you're not allowed to call people fat. It's it's fat shaming and everybody's very sensitive and you're not allowed to push people for to reach their dreams or anything anymore. It's 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 a weird place to be right now, I feel like. Um but yeah, so did you so you moved to Thailand? Is that what time did you move to Thailand? Around what year? Uh two thousand sixteen. Okay. All right. And how long until you had your first fight? I trained in Koh Samui for a, a month and I fought. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a month after starting Muay Thai, you got your first fight. Oh, well, I trained a, around a month in Australia as well. 
Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Did you have shin guards and like sixteens and headgear, or Ooh. what? Did no, you... Thailand is professional, so you just fight. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. So you just go There's straight no into shin it. Guard. Yeah, so you're going straight <laughs> shin to shin on your first fight. That's got to feel amazing. <laughs> How did that yeah, fight turn well, out for you? Actually, I won, <laughs> uh, and. I, I, in the fight, like, I didn't know it would hurt that much. Like, I was just like, it's just going to be fun. But no, it freaking hurt. And I was like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> but it was fun. Nice. Is are, is your family pretty supportive of you? Or are they able to, like, come see the fights? Or are they still doing their, their carnival thing? Yeah, yeah. They're still working the shows in Australia. Uh, at the start, my dad said to me, he said women can't fight and to find something that I can make money with. And my mom was like, I don't want you to do it, move away from me or to get hurt or anything. And I was like, well, this is just what I want to do because I spent my whole life working for them and I love them and appreciate them and everything they taught me. But it just got to a point where I had to do something that was for me. Mm -hmm. So and... just out of curiosity, um, I've, I've never been to Australia yet. That's definitely a goal of mine. And, uh, but over here, when you go to like the carnivals and things like that, the people that you see working there tend to look like they like to party a lot. Is that something that followed that lifestyle for you before Muay Thai? Did you have like any like partying time periods in your life or have you normally been pretty disciplined? Uh, the people you're talking about, I, there's a bad, there's a bad image of carnivals or shows. Uh, okay. These people actually work for us um and you know we're nice enough to give them a job and they actually do work good yeah. um they just don't fit into traditional society so actually the people we are very presentable and professional so i just want to get that out of the way but yes of course i did party and that's all i anything i do i give it 100 percent. so when i used to party yeah i was like a champion alcoholic so <laughs> yeah i yeah. And then I stopped all that with Muay Thai, luckily. Muay Thai saved my life. Yeah, that seems to be a, a trending theme, um, especially on this podcast, is Muay Thai or Jiu-Jitsu seems to kind of take over. Was that like a, a slow progress for you to go from, you know, like the professional alcoholic to the professional fighter? Or was it just overnight you were like, nope, this is it. This is what I'm doing. Yeah, it was It was gradual. Like, uh I went from being like I was really sick and unhealthy drinking every day to then I found Muay Thai and then yeah I just kind of it like took up my time and gave me something to do and when I moved to Thailand I drank a little bit but then I was like it's like it's getting in the way of my training and then yeah I just stopped yeah that's that's amazing well I'm very yeah I've I'm never very... drank or anything yeah I'm very happy that you decided to become a fighter because you gave me one of the craziest fights that I've ever seen, even like with men included, just in general, as a fight fan. Um, you and Danny Hall went to fucking war. Sorry for swearing, but like you, I, I saw you get hit with things that would lay out a normal guy. And instead of you going down, you just came back. And it was just back and forth, back and forth. And you came out on top of that. Can you kind of walk me through what it's like to be a part of such a massive fight like that? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it was really fun. Like, uh, like you said that, but in the fight, I didn't feel her hitting me. And I thought I blocked a lot of them, and I did. But, yeah, in the last round, she gave me a cut, and then I was like... <laughs> Like, it just woke me up, and I was like, I'm going to kill you. And, yeah, I just went crazy. But it was really, really fun. I like fighting like that. I love brawling. Yeah, no, you were definitely in the pocket. Like, you guys were fighting in a phone booth there. It was it was a lot of, like, very close elbows to the face, and it was a brutal fight. So you have that amazing fight, and uh, you start doing the, the road to one for Thailand, um, for the one championship contract is you're wearing the shirt right now. And 
how do you get into that process going from just, you know, training at like a local gym in Thailand to being able to have the opportunity to fight for a one championship contract, especially in Lupini Stadium, which, by the way, the fact that one is doing that is amazing. I, I think one is changing combat sports, you know, the way that they could have. Uh, Mikey Musumeci out there one time and then the next fight you have Gary Tonin doing an MMA match you know you have Mighty Mouse and Rod Tang and they're doing so many crazy things so I'm just, I'm just very curious about that whole world of, of one championship and how you got into even the position to be a part of the organization then I'd love to hear what it felt like to win that contract and finally be a part of it yeah, well, I mean, being on one championship is a dream of mine. Watching Stan Rotang become world champion, and like it was just insane. And Samila, uh, so many people, and I was like, I want that more than anything. Like to become a one championship world champion is the elite. Like yeah. that's the best of the best. Um, and so then I seen uh, on Facebook they posted that they're going to have the road to one. This was last year. Yep. Um, and I was like, oh, I've got to be in it. But the weight was 52 kilos and it was for women. And at that time I was sitting at like 49, 50 kilos. And I was like, oh, like they, that's the weight they start 52. And I was like, yeah. oh, what am I going to do? These girls are going to be cutting weight from what, 57 or something. And they're going to be like 10 kilos bigger than me. I was like, I've got to do it no matter what. I'll gain the weight. So then um, I messaged the um, the boss of Fairtex fight, uh, Prem. I was like, can I please do it? He's like, okay, come have a fight, Fairtex fight, and we will see how it goes. And uh, they actually had, they had people like scouts for the road to one. Okay. Um, and they many people had told them that I should be in it. I mean, I've been living here for seven years. Um, so I was on their roster, and they just wanted me to have a fight to see how it went. And I won that, and they're like, yep, you're in um and then yeah we did all the meetings and everything and then yeah I, I won and oh, it was amazing like oh wait but I gained the weight I I got a strength coach and uh Holly and a nutritionist conditioned nutrition and I gained like a muscle mass so much and yeah I was able to win and it was the best feeling in the world it was like training for like war for six months non-stop oh, mm -hmm. by the end of it I was dead but it was so worth it. That's insane. So, so I work doing uh, nutrition with a lot of combat athletes over here in the States, uh, some in the UK as well. And normally people are going down in weight. So for you to already be undersized and then want to pack, how much time did you have from the time that you made that phone call until you had to do weigh-ins? I don't know, but it wasn't long. I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe like, I, I don't know, a month, two months. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So but over that six month period, I gained a lot. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. That's crazy to me. Yeah. It's, it's just very rare to hear somebody gaining weight to, to make a tournament or something. Normally it's the complete opposite way around, but there's also not that many women's fights, especially through one. So I can see how the opportunity kind of like trumped any pain that you had to go through to, to be able to get to that position. Um, so you've had tons of walkouts. You've had a lot of fights. Um, so you kind of know what that, that stress is like, what it's like, you know, like five minutes to walk out and then you're getting your hands taped and everything like that. Did it change knowing that you were fighting through fair text through one championship, you know, like the, the largest names in Muay Thai, did that pressure change anything for you when you were doing your walkout and going through your routine and kind of add to the pressure of it? Or was it just another fight for you? Because every one of your fights, you look like a stone cold killer. Like nothing bothers you. You, you do. It's almost like you go into this trance and you're just focused it's it's amazing that you can do that because so many fighters look around and they can lose their focus and for you you're just you're locked in something that i've always really admired about you so 
I'm just very curious. Did you feel like those nerves coming into such a large fight? Oh, thank you for noticing. I appreciate it. Uh, the lead up, I felt it, but yeah, no, as you just said, like, uh, the actual warm up, the wrap in the hands, like, no, I, I, it felt normal. Like I was meant to be there and I felt confident, but yeah, there was pressure, but I was happy. Yeah. So you win the, the one championship, the, the road to one and when one, like they do like the confetti and you know, like you get, it's this big thing that they do. What is that win like compared to the rest of them, knowing that you finally made it to the largest organization that you can be in? You won the contract, everybody in the world seen it. Um, yeah, what is, is, what's that like for you? Like just that sense of accomplishment and happiness. No, oh, yeah, it was amazing. I don't know if you've seen the video when I won, but I just started, I fell to the ground and yeah. started bawling my eyes out. It was just like, oh my God. Like, I remember when I first wanted to do the competition and I was like, holy shit, how am I going to win? I'm so small. Like, and then I was like, oh my God, am I going to win? There's so many, like, I mean, like, these are all the top girls in the whole world competing. Mm -hmm. Like, how am I going to win? And then I was like, holy shit, I did it. You just, you got to be in it to win it. Yeah. No, you didn't just win it. You, you won it, obviously. Um, it was, it, it was amazing to watch. And not only have you won, but we briefly kind of covered um, your fight towards equality in the sport. So I was wanting to take a few minutes to kind of see exactly what you're doing for that, to get women, you know, in the ring um more fights and, and, and things of that nature so kind of walk me through exactly how you're you're trying to help the sport of, of female muay thai yeah so basically it comes back to when i first started uh when i first moved to thailand the best thing like a woman could do is fight the local stadium win a local title there's no rankings i said to my trainers that i wanted to fight at lumpini stadium they laughed at me i wanted to fight on thai fight like I wanted to be a successful fighter and make a career out of it. And they all kind of laughed at me and doubted me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be the first ever girl to fight at Olympian Stadium. Like, I don't care what anyone says. Yeah. And like, I want to, I want to help women to be, have that equality. And like, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, like if you fight good, you fight good. Like, there's men that fight shit. There's women that fight shit. There's people that fight good and good. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. And then um, I, yeah, I was the second ever uh, live tie fight. And then they asked me to be the first girl on Super Champ, but I got dengue fever. And then, yeah, the Lumpini Stadium, a Facebook post came up saying they were thinking about having women. And I was like, holy shit, it's coming true. I knew it. Yeah. And then um, I said to my trainer at the time, I was like, whatever happens in life, please, can you help me become the first ever woman to fight Lumpini? He's like, all right. He made some phone calls and then it said on Facebook, uh, uh, there was these other two girls going to fight at Lumpini Stadium first. There were two ties. And I was like, all right, it's their country. That's fair play. I'm very happy for them. I was like, please make me the first foreigner. And then it went on Facebook. There was uh, a foreigner in a Thai schedule. I was like, what the? This is, this is what <laughs> I wanted to do. And then actually, because it was COVID then, the girls fought in the car park of the stadium. And then they were like, your fight's been moved back three weeks. You're, you're, and then I was going to be the first ever girl to fight at Lumini Stadium. That's all that happened. That's crazy. I know. Yeah, because I, like, oh I, I wanted and to then... ask you about that being, you, yeah, you're not just the first woman to fight in Lumpini, but you're not from Thailand. And that's their national sport. Like, Thais are, it's it's like American and cheeseburgers, <laughs> you know? Like, it's, yeah, they yeah. go together. So, did you get any, I don't know how to word this, like, animosity dirty looks or anything like that from the top no 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 
Not at all, no. Really? Were they not really accepting of, of you being, you know, the first foreigner woman to fight in Lumpini? Yeah, well, actually, it was it was COVID at the time, so there was no audience. There was not really a lot of people there, so I didn't really get a lot of human interaction. And mm-hmm. there was only one or two media people that came to the stadium and interviewed me. So I wasn't able to get to see the interactions, but all the Thai people there that were running the organization, everyone was really lovely. That's amazing. Yeah, I remember those fights during COVID. And it just like from obviously I wasn't there, but like from the TV standpoint, from watching it, all you saw was the ring. You had no idea how big the stadium was. It was blacked out everywhere. And a big part of fighting is feeding off of the crowd, you know, especially when you're winning Mm -hmm. or, you know, what is that like going from like having people screaming at you and the Thai music going off and bets being placed all over the place and to a very quiet Lumpini stadium. That's almost, it sounds haunting a little bit to be in such a a large, like well-known stadium, having it very quiet. Well, my, I always have trainers that are very loud. I always tell them, I'm like, please be as loud as you can. So I had that. Uh, I don't know. It was just, I don't know. But saying that, now fighting one Lumpini and the stadium is packed. Oh, my God, it's so cool. Yeah, it's like having your own cheer squad. When you're winning, they're like, ah! And then you just want to go harder and you're like, ah! Yeah. So, so let's, uh, let's step away from fighting for just a few minutes. And I'm really curious what the personal life of a Muay Thai fighter is like because – you're very disciplined in like a daily routine. I got to imagine, like, especially at the caliber that you're at, you can't necessarily go out two, three times a week, hang out and then decide you want to go train a couple of times. Um, so where do you find time to have like a personal life to like, to, to start dating, you know, have a family do those type of things and just go out with friends and, and, you know, have dinner, things like that. Is that something that you're able to do? Or do you, is it your life very, very focused on, on just training right now? I just got to get my charger over one minute. I yeah. forgot what you said. Sorry. What is going on with this camera? Sorry, I should have done this before. No, you're good. Okay, so basically to your question, there is, I don't know, this is for me personally, maybe everyone's different, but there is no life outside of this and I'm completely obsessed. There's no dating, there's no friends, there's no dinners. I literally wake up, go to training, come back, eat, sleep, um, go back to training, come back, eat, sleep, and there's no human interaction except for at the gym. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, is that something that you're okay with? Like, is there a part of you that feels like you're missing out? on something or is that you're just I'll, I'll do that later you know like it's not a big deal right now how, how is your kind of your feeling process on that uh, like sometimes I like I want a partner but then I'm like I can do all of that later like right now I just want to become the best of the best help women become yeah equality um, and just like, I just have so much motivation for Muay Thai that all of that, I don't really, it doesn't bother me, to be honest. Yeah. yeah, that's, I just, I can't imagine that. Like, I know, I love training Muay Thai um, and Jiu-Jitsu. It's, it literally saved my life. I went to uh, rehab for drugs and alcohol like five years ago, and my life was just falling apart. Like, I could not keep my shit together. 
So I went to rehab and then got everything cleaned up, got sober. And then I found jujitsu and like sitting there, I just remember looking across the room to where all the Muay Thai guys were and just hearing the pads I'm like, Ooh, I want that, you know? And so switching over to that and that just kept me every single day. It was like, I'd wake up and even though I had eight, 10, 12 hours, you know, whatever of activities, work and things I had to do throughout the day, six or seven o'clock was always, you know, on my mind of, all right, I'm only four hours away until I can go do this. I'm only three hours. And it was like this countdown to get to the gym. So I can kind of understand, you know, like wanting to constantly do it. It's just very hard for, for me personally to, to, uh, to understand what it's like to not have like a larger social circle. Cause so I got to imagine you go through a lot of like mental conflict and, and things of, you know, it's personal battles, you know, that everybody has them every day, like insecurities and, and things like that, that you would traditionally have like friends you can speak to. How, what's your process and kind of going through like these personal things on a daily basis, if you're constantly training and not really taking that time to, to go through those things. Yeah, well, I mean, this is my job. Like, I understand someone like yourself, you have other things that are priority in your life, but this is my only priority and this is my job. Um, and I have one best friend, uh, Claire Rankin. Um, yeah, you should do a podcast with her. She's awesome. And nice. she, uh, we voice note each other all day. So I do have her. Um, and she's also a fighter, lives in Thailand and going through similar things as me. So I'm very lucky to have her because, yeah, there is, as you said, insecurities, doubts. I'm like, oh, my God, am I good enough, blah, blah, blah. And then she talks me through it. Or, like, I'm like, oh, I had a fight with my trainer or something like that. And she's like, it's fine. Just go do this. And, yeah, I'm very lucky I have her. Yeah. I think if you don't mind, like, we can kind of dive into, like, insecurities just for a minute. Just because I feel like, especially you, and don't take this offensively, but when you see yourself, like when I see you on camera, there's no way you can be insecure. You look like the most confident person in the world, as you have to. If you go into that ring with any doubt in your mind, it's not going to go your way. Like you have to have that confidence. Do you have a process of building yourself up to get to that point because i can't imagine it's just you wake up and you know you're that confident every single day of your life so do you have like a process that you go through to kind of like talk yourself up build yourself up and and kind of get yourself to that position it's really interesting to talk about these things because i think about them but i don't really talk to anyone about them but yeah i'm a little weird <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. And then, uh, so basically having, I have 52 fights now. Um, when I used to live in Phuket, before a woman could fight on TV, I fought every week. Um, and that built a lot of my confidence. Um, fighting people like freaking 25 kilos bigger than me um, and winning. So I was like, oh, okay, I mustn't be that bad. Um, or fighting Friday than Sunday. So, and I also have oh the video clip. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> um, at one time, I thought this girl was just freaking this much taller than me. I was like, what the fuck? But uh, yeah. I watched back on videos or even videos, uh, my recent fights, and I look at how I won and what I did. And I'm like, every time I'm like, oh, I'm shit. I, I watch it and I'm like, I'm not shit. Look, I've actually won. I did something good. Or... Like, uh, I go back and look at a training video. I'm like, all right, I'm not that bad. And I just have to refocus and remind myself that these are just thoughts. Or everyone can have a bad day uh, yeah. at anything you do. Even uh, doing the podcast or something, you might be like, oh, my God, I'm so nervous. But then if you go back and look, you're like, all right, well, I'm good at this, good at that. And that's what's really helped me, honestly. Yeah, I feel like uh, like general society can look at fighters and, and feel like, you guys are different. You know, you, you're a different breed because you do something that some people don't deem like socially acceptable. Like that's over here in the soft place that I live right now, but I'm trying to figure out how to word this. It's, 
it's refreshing to hear a professional fighter actually admit that they do go through those problems um, because it's not something that's really talked about very often. Um, myself, I'm, I'm normally around when those insecurities are at the highest um, because I, I'm there for the weight cuts. So I get to see when people are, are dropping, you know, like 5% of their body weight in a few hours in, in getting them to that ring. And some people can handle it. And that's some, some guys will get stronger during that period to where like they, their mind starts switching and they stop becoming the person and they start becoming the fighter. Other people, that's when doubts start to set in and they realize this is real. Like it, it's time, you know, you're 24, 48 hours away from stepping in that ring. Um, so to hear that is, is it's very refreshing to know that like that is a real thing. When you're going through that process, do you have like heightened insecurities or is that when you turn into the beast and you know it's time to go play? Yeah, when I'm doing the weight cut and everything, I definitely turn into the beast. Uh, I focus. As you said, if you don't and you go into the ring and you're not confident, whatever you're insecure about, that will happen. But whatever yeah. you're confident about, that will happen. Yep. So you have to be confident. And yeah, but of course, I mean, the easy insecurities, but you have to be stronger in your mind to overcome them. Because if you don't win your mind, your opponent will. Mm-hmm. Do you do anything like specific to train your mind? Because your body kind of, once you're in the ring or the cage or, you know, whatever you're fighting in on the mats and stuff, your brain kind of goes into this autopilot mode to where you're, the training takes over. And it, for me, I'm sadistic. I like to get hit once or twice before I wake up. It's not something I, I recommend, but... It, that's kind of like what wakes me up and then you know i can get there um but for other people they're just immediately there how do you go through that process are you as yeah, soon as can, you step into the ring and you're ready to go i can relate to what you said getting hit wakes you up like i said when i got cut by denny paul i was like let's go yeah <laughs> if you did that around one i probably would have got the ko but yeah um but yeah i I just shadow box a lot before I get my body ready, but for the mind, yeah, I just think like I have to kill her or she'll do it to me. So I have yeah. to win. There's no choice. Yeah. So I know we only got a little bit left of time, but I got to know. So over here in the States. Oh, you can we, do longer if you want. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Over here in the States, we just had a TBA, um, the Muay Thai tournament out in, I want to say Idaho or Iowa. And you could fight three times over the course of a weekend. And some of our guys got like they, one of our guys did really well. Um, but fighting three times in a weekend is insane. I know a lot of my listeners don't necessarily train. Um, some do, you know, but there's a lot of people that they would prefer to watch than actually feel what it's like to kick someone else's shin or, get kicked in the liver, you know, like the things that like are terrifying. How do you get through those battle wounds? Like you're not making it out of any fight unscathed unless it's like a, a 10 second KO in the first round. What do you go through? Or do you just mentally overpower your body or how do you get to the point to where you can fight on a Friday and a Sunday? That just seems insane to me yeah it comes from um all the experience i had the 52 fights that really helped me a lot in every fight you go through something different and it makes you stronger and yeah or if your shin gets battered up you're like all right well i can handle that it's already happened to me you know um but in the fight itself if you get hurt you have a choice to get go down or you have a choice to go up like when i got the cut I could have gave up and let her win. Or mm -hmm. I, in the moment, said, I've got to fucking win this no matter what happens. I've got to kill her. Yeah, and then sure. I go crazy. Like, yeah. it's a choice to win or not. All right. Yeah. And so I, I was doing some research on you. 
and you know the in in the research that i found it was a lot about like the carnival upbringing and things of that nature but i found this little little snippet of a goal that you have about buying your parents a house and wanting muay thai to pay for that and that kind of being part of the your fueling process you know like to get to where you are and now that you see that you're on the the greatest promotion for Muay Thai in the world. You're obviously not a bum, you know, so you're you're going up there. You're you're going to start climbing through the ranks and get those belt opportunities. Is that still something that's that's pushing you and how close are you to to making that a reality? Or is or do you think your parents are are happy and they and they're not going to allow you to do it? Um, I think my parents would not allow me to do it, but I'll just do it anyway. <laughs> um, and um, I think ah, uh, my brain fogged out because I thought about when my mom and dad was like, "Could you just quickly remind me of what the rest was?" Oh, the uh, yeah, you wanting to buy your parents a house and have Muay Thai pay for it, um whether or not your parents are going to allow you to do it and how close do you think you are to being able to make that dream become a reality? Um, how close am I to become? I, I don't know. Like, I don't know, like money-wise how much I need, but I think it's not far within a few years. That's um, you see now, you know, you could get a $10,000 bonus on one Lumpini in my next fight. Like, obviously I don't get to keep it all. The gym takes a cut. Sure. Um, but, like, and then when you go to one championship, if you get the bonus, it's 50000 And yeah. then plus your fight purse. So, yeah, all I've got to do is win, make it a spectacular fight, win the bonus, and then I'll just save and save and save. And then, yeah, I'll be able to buy them a house because they live in a caravan. They've never owned a house before. Yeah, it's definitely something that I can see you doing. I mean, it seems to be like if you set a goal, you're going to accomplish it. So that's definitely there. Um, you just said something that I feel like an idiot. I didn't know, um, which, which is crazy to me, unless I misheard or whatever, but is the the one Lupini that's different from one championship? Is that I thought it was the same kind of same thing. How is that structured? Yes, the last podcast I did, they said the same thing. But basically, one Lupini is the domestic version. And then one championship is the international version. Okay. All right. So how... So it's still the same organization. Yeah. It's just different levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to feel like you're close to, to getting on one of the international cards then, yeah? Oh, well, that's what the road to one is. I have the contract for that. They just haven't offered me a fight yet. I've already signed the contract. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So, all right. I just wanted to make sure. Um, do you have anybody in mind that you're you're shooting for, or are you just kind of bring them on? You'll fight anybody, anywhere, anytime. Uh, yes to both. I'll fight anyone, anytime. But I really want to fight. Not now. Um, I want more fight experience to fight Pet Dita. Like, do you know her? Uh, not too much. I know that name. It's it's definitely ringing a bell. I just can't remember. She just fought Lara Ferdinand a few weeks ago. Okay, yeah, that's probably where I, I remember that name from because it's like every Friday night one's on. So, yeah. Um, Basically, she's the Sanchai for women. Like, she's the number one of any sport, in my opinion. She's just the best of the best. She has, like, 300 fights, like, most, like, fight boys when she was younger. I fought her once on tire fight and I lost the first round, but yeah, well, she's obviously going to try to take the belt from Alicia and yeah, I've got to try my best to beat her. That, that is the ultimate. Yeah. Yeah. That's one other thing that I was curious about is you, you said you had 53 fights. Or, is that correct? 53? Uh, 52. 52. Okay. Sorry. That's actually like a fairly low number for Muay Thai fights, um, like compared to like a Thai. Um, Cause it seems like a lot of Thais, they will start at six or seven or even younger. And by the time they're like 12, 13, they'll have over a hundred fights. 
do you feel like you've kind of missed out a little bit on on the experience from not having that that younger um, experience or are you happy with the the experience that you do have uh look yeah I'd, I'd love to have the more experience but I'm happy with what I do have as having 50 fights as a foreigner is the same as having two 300 as a type yeah um so I'm very happy with my experience. I mean, it would be a lot more if there was no COVID. I just, everyone could relate to that. Yeah. Probably have 100 by now. But, I mean, the way the roads went and how everything's happened, yeah, I'm really happy with it. All right. I, uh, I just thought of something. So there's an American named uh, Kevin Ross. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he's a, he's a Muay Thai fighter. And he moved over to Thailand and he – he was fighting to where they were wearing shin pads, but they took out the the bamboo strips and replaced them with steel strips. And he actually caught a, a head kick and it cracked his skull. And he was saying it was because he was like a foreigner, um, things of that nature. But also it's kind of the ties were fighting harder against foreigners when you started do you feel like people went at you harder and have you had any major injuries so it's kind of a two-part question um my brain is is very weird but yeah did you have you noticed any like extra aggression towards you as a foreigner like you're more of a threat and have you had any any major injuries so like right now i'm I had ACL surgery three weeks ago, so that sucks, and now I can't train for a long time. And I know, like, the mental anguish of that, so I'm just curious if if you've also had to go through anything of that nature. Uh, if we could go back to what you said, Kevin Ross said, you said he had shin pads. Yeah. And he took the bamboo out but put steel. What? Yeah, I don't well, know. It? Yeah, it's... uh that does not sound correct. Yeah. What, for would... fighting? They don't fight with shin pads here. Yeah, I, I'm not sure 100%. It's it's like it's something he talks about on a lot of podcasts that he's on. And I really wish I remembered more of the details on it. Um, it was something that I wasn't planning on bringing up. It just kind of popped into my head. But, okay. yeah, no but yeah, I guess he, he definitely had like some pushback on him fighting um, local ties and kind of felt like, you know, he was almost targeted. I want to say, I don't want to put words in his mouth. And if I'm butchering, you know, that interview, I, understand you. I apologize to yeah. Kevin. Um, Kevin's an amazing dude. Um, but yeah, but yeah, so let's just scratch that whole part. But do you feel like, you've <laughs> okay. had, yeah. Do you, do you feel like you've had any, do you feel like you're just you're another asking. fighter? Yeah. 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 I don't know how to word it. I'm, I'm the, the tie is absolutely amazing to me. No one's ever done anything like that to me. Um, everyone's so lovely. It doesn't matter if you're a foreigner or a Thai. You're just there to fight. And I've never seen anyone do anything dirty like that. Um, and, yeah, everything's been amazing. Yeah, as I said, it doesn't matter if you're a foreigner or a Thai. Mm -hmm. uh, but the injuries, no, touch wood, no serious injuries. That's amazing. Yeah, I know nobody goes into a ring feeling 100% for sure. Like, you always got, like, some bumps and bruises, but... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but to not sustain any large injuries is massive, especially for longevity of your career. And you're just getting started, it sounds like. Do you have, like, an idea of how long you plan on doing this for? Or is this going to be... Yeah, just as long as I can. Yeah. Do you have an idea of how long that is, or are you going to wait for somebody else to kind of tell you it's it's time? No, I, I won't let anyone ever tell me that. <laughs> well, yeah, because I've they heard told it, me, I was like, let's get in the ring. <laughs> yeah, because I've heard it both ways. Like, I've heard some people, they have, like, all right, by 38, you know, like, there's no way I'm going to be fighting past that. Um, but then you have guys like Mark Coleman, uh, first UFC champion, he's like 57. He's taking a, a pro boxing fight now. So it's just some people just don't really know when to stop. And so I've always been curious if people go into this, obviously not thinking about when they're going to be done, but if they have an idea of how long you want to do it for. 
Yeah. I don't know. It just makes me angry about people trying to tell people they should stop. But I will do it as long as I can. There's no plan to stop. I won't limit myself. I mean, all you can do in Muay Thai is keep going up and up and up. Mm-hmm. So, like, I have friend a friend in Phuket. She's 51. She fights the same girls as me and wins. Like, oh, my God. You know? That's Age is just a number. I mean, this some guy I met at the gym the other day, I was so angry. He's like, I'm 29. I'm 29 as well. He was 29. Sure. He's like, oh, my body is so tired and it's just not the same as it was. And I was like, it's all in your head. Like, if you want to be stronger and faster, train it. Like, mm-hmm. I, if I was to fight myself when I first started 21 and now, I would smash that girl in smithereens. Oh, like, yeah. Age doesn't matter. Yeah. For sure. So what's next for... Oh, and also, sorry, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wong, he owns Fairtex. He's 79. Today, he was lifting weights. He was lifting the same amount of weights as I was today, and I was like, oh, <laughs> I think a bit more heavier than me. Yeah. That's more than me. 79? Dear God. Yeah, he still he trains every day he comes to the gym works every day oh he is a big inspiration i love him so much there's just some people that are built different and, and that's just fact some people are just built different you're clearly one of them do you realize that that you're not like everybody else like you do have an extra gear you have an extra level of confidence you just you're you're a beast like does that register to you that like you are this person like you are that guy like does that register it's to so you funny you say gear What's because that? mr wong always tells me he's like it's funny you say gear because mr wong he always says to me it's the last gear for like he's always like Mah! yeah <laughs> so he 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 is that sort of person so he can make me that sort of person but yeah, I do realize, and it makes me pissed off when people don't do that for themselves because everyone can do it if they want. Like that guy at the gym, or like you said, I, I don't want to talk bad about other people, but the soft people. Like everyone yeah. can do this if they want. Yeah. And I just, yeah, it just makes me so angry. I want the best for everyone, but everyone doesn't want the best for them. Yeah, I actually find myself being pushed away sometimes by like friends to where they'll say, oh, I really want to do this. And then I'll check back in with them in like six months to see how that project is going that they wanted. And they either quit or haven't started. And I'm just like, what the fuck, man? Like, this is <laughs> yeah, this is something you wanted you like you told me you're going to do this and you gave up on yourself. You know, like that's hard to watch as a friend but I've done it as a person. Like I've given up on myself and that's the worst thing that you can do is like, let yourself down. How do you navigate that when you see those things and that frustration, obviously you're in a world to where it doesn't happen as often. Um, especially. Oh no, it happens. Really? I mean, other people, I, not me, but I see yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, people at the gym or I don't know people everywhere. Um, sure. I see them and I'm like, you, are so spoiled you have a home that is taking care of you you have food that's taking care of you you have trainings taking care of you everything that you could imagine is all given to you and you don't want to put in the hard work you could become yeah. a superstar if you want but no they don't want to do the extra work they don't even want to do the work they have to do and i'm like you are so ungrateful yeah so okay, just, what, what and what you, you said was I tell them what I say to you. I'm like, you're an idiot. You have everything that you need to become a superstar. And you're too lazy to do it. Yeah. That's I don't know. Amazing. Maybe people don't like me because I'm so... I just tell people how it is and it pisses me the hell off. Yeah. A lot of people don't like to hear, you know, like their own yeah. mistakes um, or yeah. to like be checked and be like, no, you said you were going to do this because in our minds we can rationalize and you know come up with excuses and start to believe our own lies and yeah yeah. so i I think discipline is the thing that keeps everybody on track um so let's talk a little bit about your discipline then we can get you out of here if you don't mind what does your 
what do you do for physical and mental discipline aside from showing up to the gym on time? Could you elaborate? Uh, yeah. So like, huh? I believe it was like Eamon Barlow. She would actually like write down notes on like how she felt about like, you know, going into the fight and then read those like beforehand and then kind of like write down what happens after the fight and kind of be able to like visualize everything. Um, but then also be able to push herself a little bit further of like, all right, now I can see why I thought this way. Here's the outcome. You know, these are the facts. Um, but also like waking up at like a very specific time, going for your runs, having like your nutrition on point, um, doing like meditation, you know, like all these like ancillary type things that surround the sport of Muay Thai. Um, Cause I know some people will show up like 15 minutes after practice has started. So they miss the warm ups and then, you know, get straight into to the technical work and things like that. Whereas other people, they'll have everything lined up. They'll be there early, have their stretching done and, and things like that, you know? So I'm just curious if, if you do have like a very strict schedule um, for your body of like waking up, nutrition, things of that nature. And then do you do anything separate for your mind as well to keep your mind focused and, you know, make sure that you check yourself um, that you are accomplishing the things that you told yourself you were going to do. Yeah. So basically, yeah, I wake up the same time every day. Uh, I do the running, come back to the gym, do my stuff before, do the pad work and then all my weight stuff after. But like example with the pad work, you could do extra rounds or you could do less rounds. And I'm like, I will always want to do more than what my opponent's doing. Like, no one can outwork me so that pushes me and then with the weights even if I'm like oh my god I feel so dead I'm like I just have to do it because it's going to make me stronger like there's this thing I think about my future self will thank me for the stuff I do now so example like washing up so I don't have to wake up and be like oh freaking hell like I didn't do the dishes I got nothing to eat with or like you know like even doing the weights and then you're like tomorrow you're like oh I feel stronger um or doing the pad work you're like oh now I can do 10 rounds instead of eight rounds or something so it's just to remember that your future self will thank you yeah it's kind of like you're investing in yourself almost yeah yeah I uh I had a similar theory when I was this is gonna sound fucked up but when I was drinking a lot and doing a lot of drugs and everything it was always future self's problem because right now I'm having fun. Future self will have to deal with the credit card bills, the pain, the hangover and all that shit. And then I got sober and I realized like future self gets fucked over a lot. <laughs> and mm -hmm. It might be time to help future self out a little bit. And so now I try to do things to, to make sure that tomorrow is going to be easier than today was, or at least set myself up, you know, for success for tomorrow more than today. So that's, yeah, no, I needed to hear that, that other people actually think that way as well. So that's amazing. So, all right, well, I know we said we went a little bit over the time. Um, seems to be okay. But what is next for you? And are you, you said that you don't have a fight coming up yet or anything signed anyway. Do you have anything in the works or an idea of when we're going to get to see you next, um, when you're going to get in the ring? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm fighting next month, but I haven't announced it yet. So. But oh, okay. I do have a fight confirmed. Oh, nice. Okay. So you're fully in camp and everything right now and ready to go? Nice. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. And when are we going to hear the announcement on this fight? I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. All right. And uh, where can everybody find you so they can see your announcements and kind of know what's going on, follow your, your content, and, and hear more of your story? Oh, uh, yeah, they can follow me on Instagram, Celeste the Best Seven, or Facebook's just more personal. Uh, yeah, pretty much just Instagram. All right. Yeah, I will uh, make sure to link that like below in the, in the comments and everything so people can reach out to you or follow you and follow your content. Um, it's been amazing talking to you. It's very rare that I get a chance to, to listen to somebody who grew up in a carnival in Australia 
become a professional Muay Thai fighter in Thailand. Um, so your story, I know there's depths and very more levels to, to what you've gone through. I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface, but I genuinely appreciate having you on, um, hearing your story and getting some of your time. I know as a fighter, it's very precious for your time. Um, rest is very important. Work is very important, but I feel like more people need to be like you and just push past shit, get the job done and continue to try to accomplish your goals. So I hope people out there that hear this can see that dreams do come true. You can make things happen. You just have to put the hard work and, uh, and keep moving. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on and I look forward to seeing you next month. It sounds like, um, fighting in, are you, can you at least say, are you fighting in Lumpini again? yeah okay all right that's god that's got to be amazing that is such an iconic stadium <laughs> it's it's like the birthplace of muay thai it's that's got to be amazing so um yeah no i I'm, I'm rooting for you i know you're gonna do amazing and uh, i'm definitely going to continue following your career as i already have and keep going with that so thank you again for coming on sharing your time with me um with my audience and uh i look forward to hearing from you again and thank you so much for asking me and thanks for what you do for us fighters i appreciate it a lot yeah of course no problem so all right well i will talk to you soon and uh enjoy the rest of your it's actually evening over there right now so you're probably getting ready to go to bed yeah it's 9 30 now okay yeah all right perfect well all right again it's been amazing and uh we will talk soon okay nice to meet you see you later yeah. see you later